Okay, uh, welcome back. Um, lecture number eight. We are still on the topic of primary sedimentary structures. So in the first part, we looked at um, beds, graded beds, and also soil marks. So let's have a look at uh, other kinds of sedimentary structures. Okay. So these are scour marks on sandstone beds. So these occur on sandstones. They are rarely preserved because of the non-cohesive sandy substrate. Okay. And in this case, the scours are preserved on the top of the bed, top of a bedding plate, on the top bedding plate. Okay. Uh, so you get structures like obstacle scour. So this is an obstacle scour. It looks like a flute. It looks like a flute, right? In cross-section. So again, you have a steeper edge and a tapering edge, okay? and it is caused by uh, turbulence resulting in scouring of the sandy substrate. Yeah? Um, eddies that scour into the bed, yeah, it is produced by an obstacle on the bed. Maybe there is a shell or a pebble, and in this case, you have this obstacle scour, right? the deeper part here, and then it tapers here, right? So this is caused by a mineral water bottle here, right? So that is an obstacle scour, okay? You can also get uh, shallow scours in the form of ridges and furrows. Uh, these are millimeter scale, elongate, linear features on the bed surface caused by turbulence. We have a flow moving in this direction here, and because of turbulence, you get scours and also ridges in between. Right. So yeah, these are furrows covered downstream of obstacles. Um, okay, so those are scours. Now the next type of sedimentary structure we want to look at are called soft sediment deformation structures. Right? So some of you during first year might have uh, met with the term uh, syn depositional. Um, Sediment is in the depositional deformation, post depositional deformation, and so on, right? But just to make it general, right, we're just talking about structures, sedimentary structures, which are primary in nature, which were formed during deposition, but have undergone uh, deformation while the sediment was still soft. So we call, uh, we generally lump them together as soft sediment deformation structures. So these are uh, deformation of beds during or immediately after deposition. And it is deformation while sediment is still soft and still unlithified. So one of the co most common types of uh, soft sediment uh, deformation structures you will need, uh, especially if you're looking at things like deltaic deposits, turbidites, right, are what we call load structures. These are deformations which are produced by the presence of a reverse density uh, gradient. It forms when dense, overlying sediment, usually sand, settles into less dense, water-saturated sediment. And it produces a downward bulge of sandstone. Okay? And the internal, uh, internal bedding will also deform into the shape of the bulge. So let's just have a look at the process of formation of these structures. So initially you have a sea floor, let's say, and it is dominated by mud. The mud is still soft and it is saturated with water. Well, it's, it's underwater, right? So that's easy to explain. Uh, then imagine maybe there's a gravity flow or a storm. And the storm brings lots of sand forming a bed on top of your muddy soft substrate so you have rapid sand deposition forming a bed or deposit now remember sands are dominantly made up of quartz and quartz has a higher specific density specific gravity compared to your clay at the bottom and the clay is still soft so what happens is that the sand starts to sink below okay and this results in deformation of the muddy substrate below. Okay? Denser sand sinks and deforms. So because of the sinking of the sand, you can get lots of interesting features uh, which are preserved if uh, the deformed beds are lithified into rock. 
you can get these uh, these triangular shaped structures at the border between mud and sand. We call them flame structures, right? Where mud shoots up in between the bulges of sand. You can get these large uh, bulges going downwards into the mud made up of sand. And these are what we call load casts. We call them casts, eh? achuan, because they can be preserved as positive relief if the mud is eroded. Right? You're just left with the cast. Right? And sometimes the load casts are really pinched. Right? Sometimes it separates from the main sand body. It becomes what we call ball and pillow structures. And these all these are lumped together as what we call load structures. It tells you it tells you that there was rapid deposition, uh, there was uh, rapid deposition of sand onto a very soft substrate, right? and then you have sinking of sand into the mud. Okay, so these are load structures. So you can get uh, lots of different kinds of load structures. Like these are flame structures. Notice here you have a thin muddy layer below this thick sand here, right? Pan for scale about 13 centimeters long. And these are what we call flame structures. Well, they look like flames, right? So we call them flame structures. But in between them, you have these load casts, and these bulges here going downwards. This is a clearer load cast. Right? We have these two bulges here, right? And it is sinking into this mudstone below. This is from Lab 1. Lots of very interesting sedimentary structures are preserved in the Miocene rocks of Lab 1. And also, inside the sensor, you notice that you have the layers here following the shape of the bulges. Right? And that is because of soft sediment deformation. And on the right here, you have these ball-shaped uh, bodies of sandstone, which have separated from the overlying sandstone here, sinking into the mudstone. In this case, the mudstone has been eroded very deeply, right? So you're left with the cast here. These are ball and pillow structures. So that is a Jacob staff, uh, roughly one meter long. Okay, so the next type of primary sedimentary structure, uh, this is also soft sediment deformation, is what we call convolute lamination. Right? This is when you have in a bed, you've got these lots of these complexly folded layers, right? and they are lamina scale, right? Millimeter scale, less than yeah, less than one centimeter. And they tend to form these intervals. They, form, they are confined to a single sedimentary unit. And the overlying beds are straight. Also, the underlying beds are straight. It's just here that you get the folding. Okay. So we say that the folds are intraformational. They were not formed by tectonics. If it was because of tectonics, everything would be folded, right? Okay. And these folds are caused by deformation of liquefied, cement, uh, liquefied sediment. Sorry. Liquefaction is the loss of strength of loosely packed sediment with high amount of water content. And it is usually triggered by the ground shaking, for example, during an earthquake. So you have a high pore pressure inside the sand here. You have a sand, and the sand is saturated with water. The water is in between the sand grains. It's inside the pores. Right? Okay. So when you shake this sand, maybe because of an earthquake, everything becomes rearranged. The packing of the sediment becomes rearranged. And water is able to escape upwards. And because of this escape, it also deforms the layers. And that's why you get convolute lamination. Okay? So this is also an example of convolute lamination, just a very thin layer here, where the layers of sand laminate are folded. Also here. But the layers in between are not. Okay? So this is uh, convolute lamination. At the larger scale, you get what we call slump structures. These are folded, piled, and faulted sedimentary units. You get faults, district faults here, with associated folds. Right? And this is a large fold in a sequence of sedimentary layers, uh, sandstones and mudstones. Right? Um, but these are not formed by tectonics. Right? These are what we call slump structures. Uh, the thickness varies from less than 1 meter to more than 50 meters. Uh, and they are intraformational also, just like your convolute lamination. They are confined to a single sedimentary unit, 
meaning that the overlying and underlying beds are not deformed. And how do you get slumps? Well, they are produced by mass failure, right? mass transport. They are produced by slope instability, resulting in failure of the slope, and which leads to um, faulting and also folding of the, the, the layers. Right? So you get these slump structures. So you need to have a slope, and you still you need to have soft sediment, which has not been litified yet. Now, there is a problem sometimes in, to differentiate between tectonic folds or these, uh, these soft sediment deformation folds. Uh, yeah, it is, it is difficult, but there are some clues that you can use. Tectonic folds are caused by deformation of lithified rock due to tectonic stresses. So, uh, you have deformation of the whole rock unit, regional structure, right? While slump folds are caused by deformation of non-lithified to semi-lithified rock by slow failure and mass slow processes. So, it, these folds are bounded by undisturbed beds. Here, nice straight beds, disturbed beds. Undisturbed, disturbed. Okay, so these are intraformational and these are caused by slumping, maybe, maybe a slow failure, also in this case, right? The folds are just confined to this interval, but not the top part, all right? So just um, another example of a large slump unit here. This is from uh, the, I can't remember the age. I, I think it's Eocene. Right? This is from Cebu in Sarawak, part of the Belaga Formation. Right? These are deep water turbidites. And notice the folding here. Very large scale folding. You also have faulting and also these large blocks of sandstones floating inside the folded beds. Now, this is, this, these folds are not caused, were not caused by tectonics. The underlying beds are horizontal. And also, if we go to another location, the top beds are also horizontal. These are very large scale slumps. Uh, it is not too surprising to get these slumps associated with deep marine deposits. Uh, you can imagine in, in underwater, in the deep marine realm, you get these continental slopes, right? And you can have slope failure um, on these slopes. So another example of a slump unit, this is from Labuan. I like Labuan, lots of pictures from Labuan. Lots of examples you can use in the sedimentology course. Uh, so at the top here, you have nice horizontally bedded sandstones. These are turbidites. Right? But the bottom part here, you have a very mud, thick muddy unit. Okay? Humans were scale there. And if you trace these layers here, they form folds. And this is actually a large scale slump. We also have these large blocks of sandstone floating inside the slump. And these were probably caused by a large scale slope failure underwater. Okay, the next uh, soft sediment deformation structure are what we call dish and pillar structures. So, dish structures can be observed in, in cross sections of sandstone beds, right? And uh, what you get are these sub horizontal flat to concave upward clay laminations. So here you have a sandstone bed. This is a cross-section, the top of a bed, and this is the bottom of a bed. That's the scale, eh? So it's a very thin bed. And you notice the light color parts here is sandstone. You notice these thin layers here? These are mudstone laminae. It's very thin mudstone laminae, maybe made up of clay. Now notice the shape. Some of them are flat, some of them are concave, like upwards. They, you can say that they are dish shape, much like appearing, eh? So these are dish structures. Now associated with the dish structures are these vertical columns. Right? Yeah? And here. And these are what we call pillar structures in close association with the dish structures. Near vertical cross-cutting columns of structureless or swirled sand. So these are your dish structures. Now both these structures were, were formed by water escape. Okay. So remember again. Let's say this sand bed was underwater. It was uh, not yet litified. It's still sand. Uh, as lots of pores, high porosity, and the pores are filled in with water. It's water saturated. Right? And then you compact the sand. Because of compaction, the water need, needs to go somewhere. And the water escapes upwards. That's why we call these structures water escape structures. Right? So uh, it escapes upwards. But the problem is you have these layers of clay in between. 
and the clay and the clay layers are not permeable. They tak telap. So what happens is that the water needs to push through the clay layers, resulting is in these columns. So you get the water escape structures, right? You get forceful upward water movement, which produces the pillar structures between the dishes. Okay. All right. So you have a finer type of structure. These are still sedimentary structures because they are formed in sediments and they are formed during their position. These are trace fossils. You've learned a little bit about trace fossils in the fossil section of class SIG1005, right? And uh, well, mostly you looked at what we call body fossils, the actual remains of the organisms. But in this case, uh, we're not looking at the actual remains. We are just looking at the record of behavior of an animal. Maybe the dwelling, a nest, uh, the resting place, or a burrow of the animal, right? So these are what trace fossils are. Uh, these, are these are markings on the bedding plane or in the bed attributed to activities of fossil organisms. You don't, most of the time, you don't even know what, the, what type of animal produced it, but you know what behavior produced it. It was digging, or it was swimming, or it was crawling or feeding and so on, right? So these are these are also a primary sedimentary structure. It's good to know different types of uh, trace fossils. It can help in interpreting uh, depositional environments. For example, here are some photos from Lab One again. Um, this is the trace fossil we call Ophiomorpha. Okay? It has these sand-filled burrows with a mud lining. And we know that they were formed by some kind of a crustacean. It's the genus udang yang buat sarang. It's a, yeah, it's the dwelling of a crustacean. And also these nice vertical trace fossils here. And these kinds of casts associated with, at the bed, associated with beds of the, uh, at the base of the redite beds. Yeah. And trace fossils are very good paleo-environment indicators. Now, if you can identify the type of trace fossil, uh, better yet, you can identify the assemblage of trace fossils in a certain type of sedimentary unit. You can actually determine the deposition environment. For example, if you find this kind of uh, this kind of polygonal pattern here, right? For or right like this. This is Paleodictyon, and we we own we know Paleodictyon from the present day, and we know it it is. It only occurs in on the abyssal plain in very deep in deep marine environments. So it's very helpful when you find Paleodictyon, and you are all you are very nearly one hundred percent sure that the, the depth of the environment was deep marine. Okay, so uh, just remember that you please try to identify trace fossils when you see them in, in any top exposures you see. Okay, so I'll stop there. Those are the. This is mainly just. I'm just going through the common types of sedimentary structures to help you uh, try to identify them. This will be useful for the next part of the course. We will be looking at the different types of depositional environments and their characteristics. Okay, that's it. Bye bye.